So I'm very glad to have the opportunity to spend the next five days with you on the subject matter of the 10th Canto Srimad Bhagavatam. And in the course of these five days, we want to cover two chapters, specifically... Recording in progress. Specifically chapter number 20 and then chapter 21. Chapter 20 being the description of autumn and then 21 is the Venu Gita. So, very nice chapters. I thought I was very attracted to have the opportunity to try to present these chapters. I, I, I hope I can do justice to them. On behalf of the Mayapur Institute Maharaj we, and the students, we will like to express our gratitude and our happiness that you are with us for the next five days. Looking forward to your teaching. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Okay, so uh, let's see. All right, so the rainy season and autumn in Vrindavan, chapter number 20. You've just finished the uh, description of Krishna uh, saving the cowherd boys from the forest fire. And then before that, it was Lord Balaram killing Pralamba. So... The chapter begins with Sukadeva Goswami quoting, and I'll quote Sukadeva Goswami, the first text. To the ladies of Vrindavan, the cowherd boys then related in full detail Krishna and Balaram's wonderful activities of delivering them from the forest fire and killing the demon Pralamba. And we'll read also text number two. The elder cowherd men and ladies were amazed to hear this account, and they concluded that Krishna and Balaram must be exalted demigods who had appeared in Vrindavan. So you heard in the previous chapter how when Krishna had saved the cowherd boys from the forest fire, the cowherd boys, they also thought that Krishna must be a demigod. And that made them happy. It's quite amusing to read that section. Uh, the cowherd boys became happy, thinking that we must also be demigods, because we're friends with Krishna. And so if Krishna's a demigod, then we must also be demigods. 
Actually, of course, cowherd boys and Lord Krishna are much more than demigods. But uh, this is uh, the pastime that the cowherd boys enjoyed this thinking that if Krishna is a, he must be a demigod because he could swallow the forest fire. And so we must, we, must, we must also be demigods because we're his good friends. And then when the, when the cowherd boys told the elderly people in Vrindavan about what had happened and how Lord Krishna had saved them from the forest fire, and how Lord Balaram had killed Pralambasur, then they also thought that Krishna and Balaram must be demigods who have appeared in Vrindavan. So this is uh, part of the humour of the Bhagavatam. Of course, Krishna and Balaram are not just ordinary demigods, but they're the supreme lord of the whole cosmic creation. They're sup the supreme in the universe, and all the creation. So this is the connection from the previous chapter. The cowherd boys are explaining like this about what happened in the previous chapter. So you can see how it, it, it's like we're going through seasons here, this section of the Bhagavatam. You had the Rasa Leela in the Sarat season. And then uh, we had the, you had this uh, forest fire, the forest fire that's going to take place during the very hot season. So when it gets really hot, everything gets so dry. Those of you who have spent time in Vrindavan, you'll know in the summertime when it's very hot, it's very dry. And there's often also this very, there can be this very hot wind. And this hot wind can be fatal sometimes. That people who are there in Vrindavan, if they, elderly people, if they have any lung problem, if they're not careful and they breathe that hot air, it can take away their life. So the, the, the hot air produces some friction in the forests of Vrindavan. And because it's very dry, and so the, we know the bamboo forests are there, and the bamboo leaves, they can easily catch fire. The bamboo trees rub together and produce a spark, and one spark is all you need to get a fire going, because there's a lot of dry, re dry leaves on the ground. And so you get a fire, before you know it, there's a blazing fire in the forest. And this is what happened with Krishna and Balaram and the cowherd boys. But because Lord Krishna is the Supreme Lord, it's not a big problem for him. And he just told the cowherd boys, close your eyes, and he swallowed the fire. So that was problem solved. But we, should, we can appreciate, okay, this is a very hot season. And after the very hot season, we know how it builds up, it gets hotter and hotter. And we're going to hear like that, and we're going to come to the rainy season. It's going to be described to us now in the very next verse. So the first two verses were just like an introduction to what had happened in the past. But now we're going to begin the, with the the rainy season beginning. Text number three. Then the rainy season began, giving life and sustenance to all living beings. The sky began to rumble with thunder and lightning flashed on the horizon. And we'll read also text number four. The sky was then covered by dense blue clouds accompanied by lightning and thunder. Thus the sky and its natural illumination were covered in the same way that the spirit soul is covered by the three modes of material nature. So this is the beginning of the description of the rainy season. Uh, 
we know how it happens when you're in this part part of the world how suddenly it becomes cloudy and you get rumbling of thunder and sometimes also lightning also will be there the loud crack of lightning as it goes through the sky so the rainy season is described here giving sustenance to all living beings because when as it gets so hot becomes unbearable but then when the rain comes then it, it's like the source of life for everyone because you're all so you're so, in so much difficulty with the heat trying to tolerate the extreme heat and the the, the dryness which is especially the nature of Vrindavan there can be very dry. So these, these verses are described also in the book called The Light of the Bhagavad. It's uh, Srila Prabhupada in the year 1961. 61 means like five years before he even went to America. He was living here in, well, he's living in Vrindavan and he was thinking to go to Japan because there was an opportunity, there was going to be some kind of conference taking place and Srila Prabhupada was inspired to uh, present this, this scene which is described here in this chapter and he wanted to get pictures, illustrations drawn for each of the different verses. So he wrote his purports on these different verses and you can find them in the Light of the Bhagavad book. The Light of the Bhagavad book was brought out, it was the 1980s when the book actually came out and it was produced by His Holiness Tamal Krishna Goswami under his direction anyway. They did it in Hong Kong and they hired a, a Chinese artist to do illustrations for each of the pictures. So Prabhupada's purports in the course of presenting these different verses today and tomorrow and next day, we'll be looking at some of the verses from some of the purports from the light of the Bhagavad. Because the light of the Bhagavad is actually it's the same verses. But Prabhupada is, you know, here in, here in this chapter, light of the this description of autumn these purports are done by Ridayananda Maharaj assisted by Gopi Purana Dana Prabhu and sometimes they quote Krishna book and sometimes they simply say Prabhupada said but it will be interesting also to look at Prabhupada's purports as they're presented in the light of the Bhagavad sometimes I will also show you some of the pictures which were also done which uh, to illustrate these different verses. It's nice to see, as we say, one picture is worth many, many, many words. All right, so this first section describing the lightning and in the purport here we see lightning is compared to the mode of goodness. The mode of goodness, lightning. Yes, because light brings light. We can actually see vision. We need light. The Vedas say, Tamasima Jaktir Gama. Right? Come to the light. Don't stay in the darkness. So, lightning is compared to the mode of goodness. It's like the, the flash of light. Just like you get, you get a flash of light. Sometimes in our brain, you know, we're, we're not sure what to do. And then you get a flash. You get some inspiration. So lightning is like that, it's compared here to the mode of goodness. And thunder is compared to the mode of passion. Because thunder is the rumbling of the clouds, right? The, the, the thunder is like the rumbling of the, the clouds. And the, the, the rumbling of the clouds is like the living entity when he's saying, this is mine, this belongs to me. 
I am the doer, I am in charge, I am the controller, you know, this is the kind of rumbling which we do when we're in the material world under the influence of the mode of passion and false ego is dominant in us. So we also rumble in our own ways, right? So the, the rumbling is compared to the mode of passion and clouds are compared to the mode of ignorance. The clouds, the mode of ignorance, because with clouds the, the light is covered up. The light of the sun or the light of the moon is covered by the clouds. You, we know in the rainy season when the clouds come, the clouds are, are very dark and they stop all the light from coming through. It becomes very dark due to the influence of the clouds. So, we say Krishna Surya Sama Maya Haya Andhakar. Krishna is like the sun and Maya is like darkness. So this darkness of ignorance, this is the, the clouds compared to the mode of ignorance. And the, the, the sky, the whole sky, the pure sky, that is the absolute truth. That is that compared to the absolute truth. But the cloudy sky, which is only a portion, that, that well described here, the cloudy sky at the onset of the rainy season is analogous to the pure spirit soul when he becomes disturbed by the modes of nature. For at that time he is covered and his original brilliant nature is only dimly reflected through the haze of the material qualities. We are all spiritual beings, we are spiritual entities. The nature of the soul is Satchitananda, but the soul be is covered in, when we take our birth in the material world, the soul is covered by the modes of material nature. And that, of course, that false ego is there by which we identify with the material world and the material body. So we lose our vision of the reality. So this is the position of the living entity in the material world compared to the the cloudy season with the rain coming and the thunder and the lightning. We're, the whole chapter of the, this chapter is all uh, analogies which are given. Each Many different analogies are presented comparing the different seasons. First of all, we're going to hear about the rainy season and that will go on, that goes on up to, I think, text 22, and then it comes to the, uh, the autumn season. You know, when the rain season is over, then we come into the autumn season, and we'll hear about Krishna and Balaram, and how they go into the forest with their cows, and how they have fun there. So, there's, first of all, this description of the, rainy season and then we'll hear about Krishna and Balaram going in the forest and then it's the autumn season and that's the, the, main fun the main parts of the chapter and then just a few verses at the end. Okay, going ahead, text number five. With its rays, the sun has for eight months drank up the earth's wealth in the form of water. Now that the proper time had arrived, the sun began releasing this accumulated wealth. Right? So the purport, the Acharyas compare the sun's evaporating the earth's wealth of water to a king's collecting taxes. And Rudainanda Maharaj in his purport, he's quoted from Prabhupada's Krishna book in this description, where Prabhupada explains about how the clouds are accumulating water 
through the sunshine as it, as it, for eight months, the four months of the rainy season, that's generally what we say. You, of course, we don't usually get so much rain, but should, that's how it maybe was in Lord Krishna's time. There we have the rainy season, which would be for four months. Usually it's only a couple of months. So for eight months, anyway, the sun is there. One of the beauties of being in a country like India, and Vrindavan in particular, you get a good amount of sunshine. Prabhupada was shocked when he went to the western countries and he saw how little sunshine they get. They don't enjoy much sun sunshine, particularly when he was in the UK. It was, <laughs> it was a very big problem for him. It was so damp and cold and there was never hardly a day's sunshine. So much so that when he was on television and they asked him, what is it like in hell, Swamiji? Prabhupada said, this is hell, this England. Never see the sun. So, in Vrindavan, not a problem. Eight months of sunshine. But it's a problem in another way. The problem is that the sun is evaporating all the water. Although they get good rain for, for in the rainy season, that rain is gradually, it gradually all dries up. Dries up means it's absorbed by the sun. And the, of course water is so important for the irrigation, for, for the earth, for all the plants, for the cows. The cows drink so much water every day. Nanda Maharaj has so many cows, Vrindavan had so many cows. How to keep them all water? You need to have a good, a good rainfall. So, Prabhupada, just, Srila Prabhupada describes how the clouds are accumulating water and uh, gradually the whole, the whole place becomes very dry. And the, these clouds taking the water, evaporating the water, it's compared to the government taking taxis from the citizens. In India, of course, as in other countries also, they have a lot of taxes. Income tax and sales tax and land tax and the road tax and you, know, you have so many taxes. Actually, I, I remember I used, to, I used to preach in India. I was doing life membership for some time in Srila Prabhupada's time. And they used to say, because I would go to meet different business people, and so people told me that if we would pay all of the taxes which the government have for us, we would never have any money at all because they have so many taxes. <laughs> so... The idea is the government is supposed to take the taxis and they're supposed to, of course, use it to do good things to help the citizens. The idea is that you give money to the government and the government are supposed to make nice arrangements for the care of the citizens. So similarly, the sun is absorbing the water from the land and when the time comes, for the land, or for the people, for the farmers and so on, then the clouds are ready to give water. Then, of course, that's the rainy season. When it comes time, the appropriate time in the year, when the rains start, and they're meant to give back all the water which they've taken, which has been taken away. So this taxation is compared to the sun's drawing water from the air. When there is again need of water on the surface of the globe, the same sunshine converts the water into clouds and distributes it all over the globe. So it's one of the wonders of nature that Lord Krishna could create the universal the, or the, the planetary system in such a way that the clouds will evaporate the water. You have the water in the ocean, which is salty. 
But then, when, when it's evaporated into the clouds, then it's pure water, no more salt. And the, the clouds, somehow, they're able to float up in the sky. How do they, they... they're full of so much water, how can they stay up in the sky? Who is supporting the clouds? They must be so heavy, carrying so much water. This is the wonders of nature. So anyone who looks at nature and they can see how much, uh, these, how these things are going on, then they should be, they should understand how there's some very great intelligence there. And not, not only intelligence, but also organization to put all of these things into practice in nature. And of course, these materialistic people, atheistic people, they say, oh, it's all by chance. There's no God in charge. But anyone who looks at nature and looks at nature in the proper manner, then they can see there must be some intelligent personality behind this world. So scientific... Uh, creation, when we look at the world, you can see there's, there's creation, it's not just evolution, it's not just by chance. I was reading Bari John Prabhu's comments on Srimad Bhagavatam in the second canto, because in the second canto, the, where he, it begins about uh, contemplating the universal form, so in contemplating the universal form, the, he points out that when you look at everything which is there within the universe and how it's all presented there as an, in a form, you can understand there must be some intelligence there. It's not just a, a chance. I mean, so scientists and big uh, scholars Philosophers, they don't design, they don't, when it comes to their own house, they don't just let it all happen by chance. Oh, my house, yeah, it was just by chance, you know, everything just came about, it was all just designed by chance. And, and he said also, their salaries are not by chance. You know, when they go for a job and they work, oh, just, just, oh, just by, let's see what Krishna, let's see what chance happens, what chance provides for me. I'll take whatever chance arranges for me, for my salary. No, they're, they're very clear how much money they want and what place they're going to live in and these things. They, they talk about chance, but when it comes to actually living by their philosophy, nobody can do it. This is a fact. These, you, you see the same thing with the Mayavadis, the impersonalists. They talk about impersonalism. But they're very expert in being personal and enjoying the material world. And they talk that life has no meaning, but they, they still enjoy so many things. So they have a philosophy, but they don't practice it. But in Krishna consciousness, we see bhakti yoga is not only a philosophy, but it's a way of life. And we live according to the philosophy. We apply the principles in our own life. Any comments or questions so far? Okay, we'll go ahead. Text number six. Flashing with lightning, great clouds were shaken and swept about by fierce winds. Just like merciful persons, the clouds gave their lives for the pleasure of the world. <laughs> so here, Sukadeva Goswami is giving this example that during the rainy season, there will be lightning and there will be big clouds and some strong winds, fierce winds can be there, and the clouds will be driven around. So these clouds, they, 
Of course, they poured their rain onto the land for the pleasure of the world. So they're, they're giving their lives, the cloud, of course, they're giving up all the water which they're carrying for the pleasure of the, the earth planet and for all the inhabitants on the earth, they're all relieved to get the water. So Sukadeva Goswami says, just like merciful persons, the clouds give their life for the pleasure of this world. We know in the Srimad Bhagavatam, we read about Ranti Dev. Ranti Dev in the Srimad Bhagavatam. He also, he was, uh, remember, he was fasting. And at one point, somebody, some, some Brahmana came or some Devo Vaishnava came and he gave half his food. And then some Sudra came. And then he was left with just a glass of water. But then some, some other person came with his dogs. And he gave them the water. He gave his water, which he had, his own, own glass of water which was remaining, which he was going to take to break his fast. He gave that up as well. And so we see some examples of like, like that great souls who they sacrifice for others. That is actually the Krishna conscious philosophy, that we should be willing to sacrifice for the pleasure of others. We give for others' benefit. We, we're not, we shouldn't be selfish. We want to offer everything for the pleasure of the Lord. And his devotees, pleasing the devotees, seeing Krishna in everyone. So we like to try to do things for their benefit also. Reading from the purport, just as great compassionate personalities sometimes give their life or wealth for the happiness of society, the rain clouds pour down their rain upon the parched earth. Although the clouds were thus dissipated, they freely provided rainfall for the happiness of the earth. Of course, we have many examples in our scriptures of great souls who sacrificed their lives for others. Who, would, would, would some of the devotees, maybe some of you would like to suggest something? Who can you think, who's, who had this mood to give their life for others? Dabiancha. Dadichi. Dadichi, yes, right, very good, Dadichi, that's a very, that's right, that's a nice example, to Dadichi, that Indra had approached Dadichi, uh, because Indra had originally requested Lord Narayan to kill Vritasura for him, but Lord Narayan said, no, no, I'm not going to kill him, you have to kill him yourself. And Lord Narayan told him, you could go to Dadichi, and he's very austere, and his body is full of great power because of all the tapasya he's done. And if he will give you the bones from his body, then you can make a weapon which can kill Vritasura. So Indra had to go to Dadichi and request Dadichi to, to give his body. And Dadichi, of course, he, he was... He, because he was a great yogi and he was already detached from the world, he, he didn't mind, but he wanted to hear some philosophy from Indra. So he said to Indra, don't you know the body is the thing we're most attached to? So then Indra had to justify giving up that body. And Indra, he, he offered his suggestion was, he said to Dadiji, he said, well, he said, you know, it's, some, it's very, very difficult sometimes to ask people for charity. It's not easy to come and ask people for charity. And, and sometimes we see people actually, they have great difficulty to do Sankirtan, to go out and sell books. They, they don't, they've never had to ask people for charity before. And they don't feel very bold, they feel timid.
to go to people and request them to give some donations for the book. Some people don't like that at all. They just find it very difficult to do it. So Indra said to Dadichi, he said, you should know it's very difficult to ask for charity. And, and the, but he said to Indra, and I know sometimes it's also very difficult, very difficult to give charity. Because some people, they may be approached for charity, they may not have the means to be able to give charity. Although they may be charitable people and they may be inclined to give charity, they may not actually have the means to actually give charity. You know, sometimes you go to a home and maybe the husband lost his job and they have the, the wife and husband are there with children and they're struggling how to maintain the home and you go there and you ask them for charity and they're actually very pious people and they'd really like to give charity but they just don't have the means. So sometimes it's very difficult for people to also give charity. But, but Indra then, then said, but it's also difficult to ask for charity. <laughs> So, in this way, Dadichi was convinced that he should give his body to Indra. So, very nice example. Yes, Dadichi. Yeah? Uh, yes? Another example is uh, King Shibi. Oh, yes. Very good example. Yes. Maharaj Shibi. Yes, Maharaj Shibi. He was giving shelter and the pigeon came to him for shelter because uh, the eagle was chasing the pigeon. So the eagle was a big powerful bird and he came to Maharaj Sibi and said that, where's that pigeon? That was my foot. And Maharaj Sibi said, well, the pigeon has come to me for shelter and I vow that anyone who comes to me for shelter, I will, I will protect them. I will not let any harm come to them. So then the eagle demanded that that was my meal, I have to eat. If you're, if you're not going to let me have the pigeon, then you should give me food equal to the weight of the pigeon. So Maharaj Sibi agreed that he would cut flesh from his own body equal to the weight of the pigeon. But the problem was when they, bought, when they brought the scales forward, <laughs> right? that when they, they put the, the pigeon on one side and when he began to cut flesh off his body, somehow the flesh was never enough to equal the weight of the pigeon. And he was cutting so much flesh, finally he was thinking maybe you have to cut his own head off to offer it to equal the weight of the pigeon. And so at that time the two birds revealed themselves as demigods and how they'd actually come to test him. And of course it was the same with Rantidev, that Rantidev was also being tested by the demigods. They wanted to see the limit of his charitable nature. So we should always think like that, that you know, when people come, that maybe these are demigods coming to test our charity. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <clears throat> yes. Can we say uh, Bhishma Dev's sacrifice was also no less than sacrifice of life? Bhishma Dev's sacrifice? And what, yeah. In what way he sacrificed? He uh, vowed not to marry for sake of his father marrying the desired bride. Oh, okay. Yes. And, and he also vowed not to become a king so that his father could marry the desired bride. Right, so he vowed, he made the vow of Brahmachari, celib lifetime celibacy, yeah, he won't marry. So that was, you're saying that was a sacrifice for, the, for his father, right? Yes. Uh -huh. Yes, that was a sacrifice for his father so Maharaj Santanu could get married again and he married Satyavati, right? So, okay, yes, that's one sacred. Then you, you have also the Yayati's sons. Yayati had sons and he'd been cursed to become old. And they asked his sons to take his old age. But it was the youngest son, 
Pur, uh, Puru, the youngest son Puru, he agreed to take the old age for Yayati. So he took the old age for his father, so his father could continue to enjoy sense gratification. And the result was that when Yayati finally gave up his path of sense enjoyment, it was Puru who became the king. Although he was the youngest son, he became the king because he, was, he had made the greatest sacrifice that he took the old age for his father. Mm -hmm. So, very good, nice examples. We see how really great souls, they do sacrifice. Here in the purport, Prabhupada talks about, uh, or rather, uh, Sri Dayananda's purport, uh, they talk about Maharaj Dasarat, how he was giving charity, how he was fighting, and then he was also giving so much charity. He said, uh, when there was a need of giving charity, he used to distribute money exactly as the cloud distributes rain. That distribution of rain by clouds is so sumptuous that it compared to the distribution of wealth by a great munificent person. The clouds of downpour is, is so sufficient that the rains even fall on rocks and hills and on the oceans and seas where there is no need for water. It is like a charitable person who opens his treasury for distribution and who does not discriminate with whether the charity is needed or not. He gives in charity open-handedly. We heard also how Nanda Maharaj, when Lord Krishna was born as his child, he was also giving charity in a similar manner, indiscriminately. Everyone who came, whatever they wanted, he would give them. He was so happy. All right, I, I just read this little section here from the purport. Metaphorically speaking, remember these are all metaphors which are being presented here. Something is said to be like another. Metaphorical, metaphorically speaking, the, light, the lightning in rain clouds is the light by which they see the distressed condition of the earth. And the blowing winds are their heavy breathing. The blowing winds, the heavy breathing, just like when somebody is very emotional or anxious for something, you breathe heavier such as that found in a distressed person. Distressed to see the condition of the earth, the clouds tremble in the wind like a compassionate person. Thus they pour down their rain. So it's a beautiful analogy of the rain clouds giving up all their water, giving up all their life for the benefit of others. We can see the comparisons in the world to great people. So going ahead, text number seven. The earth had been emaciated by the summer heat, but she became fully nourished again when moistened by the god of rain. Thus the earth was like a person whose body had been emaciated by austerities, undergone for a material purpose, but who again became fully nourished when he achieved the fruit of those austerities. It's, all right, so we have, we have seen also examples of personalities doing this kind of thing, doing austerities and body becoming emaciated, particularly in Srimad Bhagavatam, the example of Haranya Kashipu is there, how he did his austerities and he was standing on his tiptoes and all of his flesh was eaten away by ants, but somehow he was keeping his life air within the body, within the bones. So his whole body was totally emaciated, no flesh, it was just bones. But then Lord Brahma came and Lord Brahma poured his Kamandalu over him and he got a rejuvenated body. 
They became strong, very powerful body. So this is described here in this verse. People who do these austerities for some material purpose, right? They want they have some material purpose in mind. Of course, this is not the idea. And certainly as devotees in the Bhakti Mark, we're not interested to get some material blessings. But, unfortunately, there are a lot of materialists in the world. And people who do these kind of austerities, you could say they're a little better than just a gross sinful materialist. Because they're, they, at least they're, they're, they recognize some superior being. They're, and they recognize the need to also undergo the austerities. Generally, people, they don't want to do any austerity at all. They just want to enjoy. They think life is just meant for enjoyment. There's no, why should we do any austerity? Just enjoy. That's the philosophy. Charvaka Muni, Prabhupada quoted Charvaka Muni, beg, borrow or steal, but eat ghee. So I did is enjoy. Don't worry about doing any austerity. Why should you do austerities? No. Just enjoy, eat, sleep, be happy, enjoy. Death comes, okay, that's the end. But somebody's doing austerities, they have a little more higher consciousness. Of course, it's unfortunate they're doing their austerities for a material purpose. So in the purport we read, sometimes when a country is subjugated by an undesirable government, persons and parties undergo severe penances and austerities to get control of the government. And when they attain control, they flourish by giving themselves generous salaries. They also, this also is like the flourishing of the air in the rainy season. Actually, one should undergo austerities and penances only to achieve spiritual happiness. In the Srimad Bhagavatam, it is recommended that tapasya or austerity should be accepted for realizing the Supreme Lord. By accepting austerity and devotional service, one regains his spiritual life. As soon as one regains his spiritual life, he enjoys unlimited spiritual bliss. So we read in Srimad Bhagavatam about uh, the importance of doing austerity. Prabhupada particularly was fond of quoting the verse by Lord Rishabhdev, where Lord Rishabhdev is speaking to his sons. Right? Who can tell me that verse? <laughs> Yes. Right. Thank you, Prabhu. Yes, very nice, right. Lord Rishabdi is telling his sons that this life is not meant for just enjoying pleasure like the hogs and dogs that eat stool. The hogs and dogs, they're just eating stool. Do you want that sense gratification? No, you should undergo tapasya. And then what is the result of tapasya? To get that brahmasokyam, of course we have to purify ourselves. First there's purification. By doing tapasya we get purification. And with that purification, then we can go on to taste the Brahmasokyam, the spiritual pleasure. So this is the, the process. So as devotees in our Krishna consciousness movement, are, are you able to do any tapasya? What tapasya do you do? Anybody? Are you doing any? Chant Hare Krishna Mahamantra. Chant Hare, that's a tapasya for you? <laughs> uh, 
No? What, what's your tapasya? Chanting Hare Krishna is the tapasya? Really? Yeah. The aim of tapasya is to advance in spiritual life. So that's what we do. That's, it's considered as tapasya for us. Yeah. Well, depends how much, you know, how much time, how much effort you make to chant Hare Krishna, you know. Of course, if you do more chanting, you could say, yeah, great tapasya, more tapasya. You're putting more effort into the chanting. But there, what, what is tapasya? Anybody else like to tell me some of what tapasya you do? Maharaj, tapasya means that we should follow the punctuality. Every, every day we should wake up 3.30 or 3 o'clock and go to Mangarati, attend all temple program until a uh, uh, morning program. This is also tapasya Maharaj. Okay. That's not a very great tapasya. After, you know, so... So many people go Mongol RT and so on, you know, I don't, eh, they're pious, it's a pious thing, I, I don't know if it's really great tapasya. Uh, <coughs> yes, generally we think of a karasi, that the karasi can be a tapasya, definitely there should be some vow there, that a karasi, either you, you, you know, not taking grains, not taking any, minimizing our eating on that day and uh, increasing our chanting and hearing. Ekadasi, it's a day to increase our chanting and hearing and minimize our eating and sleeping. So that's one kind of tapasya. Uh, Maharaj, um, according to Bhagavad Gita, uh, being satisfied is the tapasya of the mind. Yes. That's, uh, really t that's a really tough one. Ah, yes. Very good. That's a good one. To be satisfied. Mm. But in one lecture, Yes? In one lecture, Prabhupada says that uh, one man should be satisfied with one woman and one woman should be satisfied with one man. This is tapasya. <laughs> really? Uh, that's interesting. Well, we'll come up to this. This is going to be discussed more. It's coming up in this chapter. We'll hear about one man, one woman. But I, thinking, I was thinking actually that the tapasya for this age is actually sankirtan, to go out and preach and distribute the mercy of Lord Chaitanya in the mood of Lord Nityananda. Just as Lord Nityananda approached Jagai and Madhai, that is the real austerity, to give Krishna consciousness to others, to go out there and try to introduce Krishna consciousness to the conditioned souls. And that is, that is very pleasing to Lord Krishna. Bhagavad Gita nachatas man manusheshu kaschin me prihakritama. There's no one more dear to me than he who is trying to distribute this Krishna consciousness, trying to teach this knowledge to others. So, that is really a great austerity. Uh, one devotee from the UK, I remember uh, in Prabhupada's time, where devotees were traveling, we, you know, we, the temple was in London, uh, and, but we found that by traveling out of London and going to visit other cities and towns, we could distribute more books. So we were having a vehicle and we were devotees were staying in the vehicle and going out and distribute books. But we, the, there was no place to stay and the devotees didn't have a lot of money or anything, so they would just sleep in the van in the night. And sometimes it would snow and, and they just told Srila Prabhupada, they said that sometimes in the snow we get out of the van and we'll use the snow to take our bath, you know, because uh, we're just sleeping in the van, so it's, we, we, there's nowhere to bathe, so if it snows, we get the snow and just rub the snow on our bodies to bathe. And the devotee said, in this way we're all enjoying transcendental bliss, performing sankirtan and distributing your books. And when Srila Prabhupada read this letter, he was so pleased. And he wrote back to the devotee and he told him, he said, I can understand this is all just like play for you. 
He said, you're doing the greatest austerity, greater than any of these great yogis could ever do in, in previous yugas. He said, you're doing the greatest austerity, but it's all just like play for you. So Prabhupada was so pleased. Prabhupada always, he liked to get letters which were pleasing. If somebody wrote to him complaining, it, it was not pleasant for him. And Prabhupada described that, he said, this is the neophyte tendency, when people are complaining. They're always complaining, fault-finding, complaining about this and that. But when, you, when we would write to Prabhupada and glorify devotees and glorify the activity, then Prabhupada would feel so happy. He really, he liked to get good news naturally, <laughs> you know, it's a natural thing. So austerity, is, it should be accepted to realize Krishna. And so we do these kind of austerities. It's uh, for our purification. Okay, going ahead, text number eight. In the evening, twilight, during the rainy season, the darkness allowed the glowworms, but not the stars, to shine forth. Just as in the age of Kali, the predominance of sinful activities allows atheistic doctrines to overshadow the true knowledge of the Vedas. So Prabhupada talks about the age of Kali. The age of Kali, predominance of sinful activities and atheistic doctrines. So we, we see the problem in the age of Kali that people are not properly educated. They don't know what is actually the duty of human life. They don't understand the importance of sacrifice. And this is why there's so much inequality in the world in relation to wealth and even water and so on, because people don't perform their duty of sacrifice. Everyone's meant to perform sacrifice. And in Kali Yuga, the, the, the proper sacrifice is given by Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, the Harinam Sankirtan, the chanting of the holy names. And we're not meant to just chant our, in our own, just sit in our own homes comfortably. We're meant to go out and chant in the public. We're meant to give the holy name to people. So this is the real Yuga Dharma. But not everybody can appreciate that. As, as, it, as described here by Sukadeva Goswami, he talks about the glow, the glow worms, right? glow worms during the rainy season, in the evening, during the rainy season, we cannot see the, the light of the moon. Why not? Because there's so many clouds in the sky, so many rain clouds in the sky, so that the light of the moon is blocked, and instead we just see the light from some glow worms are there, and we're thinking, oh, this is the light, the glow worms. And we don't see the stars, you can't see the moon or anything. You can only see the, the light of the glow worms. And so the age of Kali, we get all of these different atheistic doctrines which overshadow the true knowledge. Very difficult preaching in the age of Kali. But at the same time, very Wonderful, right? because simply by chanting the holy name, you can get all perfection. So reading from the purport a little here, I've marked some of the sections. Similarly, in the age of Kali, persons who are atheists or miscreants become very prominently visible, whereas persons who are actually Following the Vedic principles for spiritual, for spiritual emancipation 
are practically obscured. This age, Kali Yuga, is compared to the cloudy season of the living entities. In this age, real knowledge is covered by the influence of the material advancement of civilization. We should understand this more carefully. Real knowledge is covered by the influence of material civilization, uh, covered by the influence of material advancement, right? What, what's it? it? By the advancement of materialism, or, okay, the influence of the material advancement of civilization. Material advancement of civilization. Real knowledge has been covered over it. Could, would someone like to give some examples of this? I, I will begin, maybe. I'll give one first of all. I was thinking one of the things which we think is important today, you know, and of course it's, it's important, material advancement. People have to use, use computers and handphones, drive cars. If you can't do these things, oh my goodness, you know, don't you know anything? You don't know how to, you don't know how to do this, you don't know how to use your handphone, you don't know how to use a computer, you don't know, you don't drive, you know, these kind of things. This is what people think is, you know, education, they think this is real knowledge. If you go, I, I was shocked, I went to USA, several, many years ago now, I went to USA when I was a young devotee, and I saw how everyone drives there. Everyone drives, but practically they can hardly write. They could hardly write, they could hardly read. But they could drive their cars really good. They were really expert in driving cars. I, I thought it was kind of strange. But this is the way the society has become in this age. Do you have any other examples? Uh, do you have any? Do you agree with this, or do you have any uh, uh, maybe uh, disagreement? Yes. Everybody quiet. <laughs> okay. Especially nowadays, we see that people I don't know how to maintain relationships. Human relationships have become in intolerable. Even though uh, they can handle te uh, technological gadgets, but they can't handle other human beings. Yes, that's a very good point, Prabhu. Thank you for bringing that up. It, it's very true, you know, people don't speak to each other hardly, because everywhere people are just simply in their hand phone, they have their hand phone and they're texting this person and that person and doing this, you know, and, and they don't notice anything going on around them. They're just so absorbed into their hand phone, their, their whole relationship is with that little mobile phone that they've forgotten about the people around them the most important. So, uh, it's recommended if you go to a meeting, you're going to be with people, leave your handphone behind. Are you going out with people for a meal? Don't take your handphone. Just forget, you know, you, you want to do something? Turn off your handphone. Particularly, you want to chant Japa? Turn off that mobile phone. We get so dependent on these things, oh, we so hooked on them, we've forgotten everything about being personal and relating to people. And so, that's very, very important for us. And we're, th um, we're thinking this is knowledge, we're thinking this is the modern world, right? <laughs> yes, Prabhu? Uh, Maharaj, uh, what comes to my mind, which I see around uh, this influence of material advancement, I mean, in, in, in terms of what we call uh, knowledge or what we call education, this kind of education is actually, in a way, uh, increasing the disparity be between different economic groups. Where the rich are becoming richer, poor are becoming poorer. It's like, actually, it's not, a, in a way, uh, kind of 
uh, elevating every verb body because that kind of institution is uh, reserved or is available to select few who can take advantage of that more and more people they are like they don't get that kind of facilities average or below average so then that disparity like it grows it's like we see in this during corona times as we see uh, most people they have got their businesses shut down jobs you know like, uh, without jobs but that does mean that doesn't mean that everybody is on the is losing somebody is gaining at the expense of someone else and that's like that's the that's the real trick so it is made in such a way that some people will be having a really good lives they will they will be filthy rich at the expense of others yeah, yes right yes definitely it's not that everybody's suffering in the covid time you know the, the doctors are doing good business and the vaccine people are doing very big business and the pharmacy shops also they're doing a lot they're selling a lot of drugs a lot of things for fevers and so on and then uh, you've got i heard recently also that uh, because so many things are done online so everybody has to get software programs a lot more software programs are being written so there's a lot of work for software engineers writing programs so they're cleaning up you know so people are definitely some people are doing good uh, my god brother told me he said, whenever there's an economic crash when the economy collapses he says that's when they see they, they, they sell more of the most expensive cars the most expensive cars sell more when the economy crashes somehow I don't know how it works, but this is a fact. <laughs> so, yeah, we see these kind of things going on. So, we, we do want people to become a little more aware of the world and the people around them. At the same time, you know, we talk about there's the extrovert and the introvert. So, we would condemn someone for being an extrovert. Someone's extrovert, they're into their own self. But, and, and the introvert, he's just, you know, he's just lost. He's only, you know, he's not thinking about anything. But someone who's a bit more ex extrovert, he's outgoing, so he's more aware of the world and the people around them. We usually would appreciate more, you know, somebody's introspective, he's an introvert, he's introspective, he's thinking about life, he's more reserved and controlled. But we shouldn't just be thinking only about ourselves to the extent that we deny others and we forgo all personal relationships. It's nice to be introspective, but we shouldn't just be completely oblivious to everybody else. That is also not the mood. Right? We, we do want to be thinking about others. So, yes, personal relationships are very important. So, the, the example is given here about the glow worms. Uh, the, in the purport it writes, Men, the cheap mental speculators, atheists, and manufacturers of so-called religious principles become prominent like the glow worms. So we did see people, you know, who were really not Vedic, who were, who were like atheists and pseudo-religious people who were uh, who how they became they do become prominent they can become quite prominent of course mayavadis are all atheists practically because they're preaching we can all be we're all god so they're all atheists and they're all offenders to the but they're they're very prominent there's so many big mayavadis and there's so many people also mental speculators big professors and scholars big speculators you know they come up with their theories about the origin of the world and then people manufacture religious principles manufacturing religious principles uh, just like there was one famous uh, sadhu in bengal 
he told people, it's all right to eat fish. Fish, fish is the fruit of the sea. So that kind of thing, you know, manufacturing religious... And then they talk about Daridra Narayan Seva, that God is a poor man, that when you serve the poor man, you're serving God. So Lord Narayan has become a poor man, he's become a beggar in the street. This is, these are some examples of manufacturing religious principles. Can you think of some others? Maharaj, breaking the four regulative principles is considered progressive. <laughs> considered progressive <laughs> for who? <laughs> who says this? In the modern world, you see, if you if you go to your if you go to some corporate meetings and all, if you are not uh, eating meat and drinking and you know uh, freely mixing with people, then you are considered to be backward. No, oh, yeah. <laughs> really, it's got like, I know in China it's like that. They told me in China that if you can smoke, a, if you smoke a lot and drink a lot, you'll get a job. People will love you. And <laughs> they'll love you because you smoke a lot and drink a lot. <laughs> but if, if you don't do these things, you're really in pro having a, you're going to have trouble. So people have to do these kind of things just to make it in the material world. Is it worth it? We should always consider, is it really worth it? So people, the purpose is people should learn to take advantage of the actual luminaries of the sky, the sun, the moon and stars, instead of the glowworm's light. Actually, the glowworms cannot give any light in the darkness of night, as clouds sometimes clear even in the rainy season. And sometimes the moon, stars and sun become visible. So even in this Kali Yuga, there are sometimes advantages. Haribo! There's advantages of the Kali Yuga. Yes, we need to always remember the advantages. And of course the advantage is Parambi Jayate Shri Krishna Sankirtan. The Kale dosha nide rajan ashtihe eko mahadguna kirtanad eva krishnasya mukta sangha param brajit. That although this age of Kali is an ocean of faults, there's one good thing about it. And that one good thing is that simply by chanting the holy name, one can get all perfection. And that perfection, of course, is to get out of this world of birth and death, to get free from it, right? Okay, so we'll, we'll take a break. You like to have a break, right? Yes, Matt, for 10 minutes? Yes, 10 minutes. You can chant Gayatri. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Hare Krishna. I'd like to show you the purport which is there in relation to this verse, text number 8, which comes up in the light of the Bhagavad. Right? I'll read the text again. Is it Can you see my screen? Are you able to see my... Yes, Maharaj, we are able to see. Okay, I, I'm reading from the, this text. This is the light of the Bhagavad, and it's a, equivalent to text. Oh, you're not able to see the light of the Bhagavad, the other book? No. Hmm. <laughs> Maharaj, you have to stop this share and then go to that book and share again. Oh, okay. So that, that will take out the, the Bhagavatam then. So I have to, what, stop stop this share? Stop. Yes, yes, Maharaj. And then, then put the other book in. Huh? And put the other book and then screen share again. When I'm, the name re-share and select the other book. Okay. Now you can see it, the light of the Bhagavad. Yes, we see that. Mm. Okay, so the purport, are, are the verses here, they, they don't do it by verses, it's just the, the whole the presentation of that script. The evening in the rainy season is dark all around. There is no sign of the twinkling stars on the horizon or the pleasing moon. 
They are covered by clouds, and the insignificant glowworms become prominent in the absence of the luminaries in the open sky. So, I wanted to bring some of the points. I think it's good for you to hear them. I've marked them up. In Kali Yuga, there is dearth, there is a dearth of proper guidance. One may take guidance in the evening from the stars and moon, but in the rainy season, the light of guidance comes from insignificant glowworms. The real light in life is in the Vedic knowledge. And then Prabhupada, this is Prabhupada actually, this is Prabhupada's writing. In the godless civilization of the age of quarrel, there are countless religious societies uh, them trying to ban in its editing, trying to banish God from religion. Glowworms want to be prominent in the absence of the sun and the stars. And these small groups following various religious conceptions are like glowworms trying to be prominent in the eyes of the ignorant mass of people. And then here, in the present age of quarrel, the, the, the chain has been broken, the disciplic succession has been broken here and there. And thus the Vedas is now in, in, interpreted by unauthorized men who have no realization. The so-called followers of the Vedas deny the existence of God, as in the darkness of a cloudy evening. The glowworms deny the existence of the moon and the stars. So, <laughs> Prabhupada, this is in 1961, Prabhupada wrote like this. So, how much worse the situation is today? <laughs> so, the, the particular problem being that Kali Yuga, there's a, a dearth. Now, uh, there, there, there's no proper guidance. This is the problem, the dearth of proper guidance. There's so many other people, unqualified people want to guide. So there's a real need for people to come forward and to preach the actual knowledge, the real mission of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So this is Kali Yuga. <laughs> okay. So that was Prabhupada's like of the Bhagavad. I'll, I'll go back to the Srimad Bhagavatam. Oh, I should close this, right? And okay, so yes, we're... Yes, in Bhagavatam. Yeah, text 9, okay. So Bhagavatam, text number 9, the frogs who had all along been lying silent, suddenly begin croaking when they heard the rumbling of the rain clouds. In the same way that Brahmana students who perform their morning duties in silence begin reciting, <coughs> begin reciting their lessons when called by their teacher. <coughs> Excuse me. So, we know in the ashrams, you have to wake up people in the morning and get them up to Mongol Arti and, you know, usually in, in the temples we have someone go around with a bell, it depends where you are exactly, of course, but somebody's there to wake up everyone in the ashram, get people up in the morning. Prabhupada said, everyone should be up by four o'clock in the morning. This was Prabhupada's standard. He used to write letters to devotees. Devotees had gone off to open centers somewhere and Prabhupada would tell them, make sure you get up at four o'clock, by four o'clock in the morning. So, four o'clock is not early actually. Four o'clock is the standard time. Sometimes when I'm traveling, I, sometimes I would stay in a Buddhist temple and in the Buddhist temple, everyone gets up by four o'clock in the morning. 
and they also ring a bell. They have a big bell, a big bell. So it makes it boom, boom, like that. You know, and all the monks will get up and they'll take the bath and begin their meditation. So here also, Prabhupada explains in relation to the frogs who begin chanting, they begin their croaking. You know how the Prabhupada was expert in croaking, the croaking of frogs. He'd heard it so much. So uh, the frogs begin to croak and of course that's bringing the snake of death. But here it's a little different. Here it's described that the, the, as the frogs begin croaking when they hear the thunder and they know there's going to be some rain. The students in the same way when they hear the, 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 the cries of the teachers, then they wake up and they begin to do their work. They begin to chant the Vedic mantras. It's written here, everyone is sleeping in the darkness of Kali Yuga, but when there is a great Acharya, by his calling only, everyone takes to the study of the Vedas to acquire actual knowledge. So we actually saw Srila Prabhupada, great, and in the time also before Srila Prabhupada, Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati, and before that, great devotees like Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and all of his associates, how they got the whole world, they, they brought Krishna consciousness to life by their preaching, and the holy name was chanted everywhere. People became very much Krishna conscious. So this should be the mood. We need great devotees, great acharyas. And all the devotees should be like an acharya, calling everyone to take up the study of the Vedas and actually acquire knowledge. And we can see now Bhagavad Gita becoming more and more prominent. To give you some examples, you know, Malaysia. Malaysia, there's a, a South Indian population there. Most of the people who are Hindu there are South Indian, Tamils. So Tamil people, when, when the devote Krishna consciousness movement first came there, we, uh, the Tamil people, they have their own prayers, you know, they, they're mostly worshippers of Kartikeya, or the Murga, they worship Murga. And so they, 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 uh, they don't chant prayers to Krishna. They didn't know the Bhagavad Gita hardly at all. It wasn't known at all hardly. There was only a few North Indian Gujarati people who knew Bhagavad Gita. But the South Indian people, practically none of them knew. They were all just learning prayers to Murga, or Durga, or Ganesh. They didn't know Bhagavad Gita at all about Lord Krishna. But since our Krishna consciousness movement has come there, and because of our devotees distributing books and doing so many programs, more and more people are learning the Bhagavad Gita and they're appreciating how it's a, so much knowledge, so much wisdom is there, practical knowledge, which is useful in their daily life. So that was one example. Another place where I saw the Bhagavad Gita become more popular was in a country called, a small country, Taiwan. Taiwan is a, you know, it's a really Chinese island, all Chinese people there. But uh, when we first went there, nobody really knew Bhagavad Gita and even we go to the yoga studio and yoga teachers, they didn't know the Bhagavad Gita. But over the years, now, more and more editions of Bhagavad Gita have come on the market. Huh? Why are we seeing all of these editions of Bhagavad Gita? People have seen our Bhagavad Gita and they also, they want to write their editions. That's the problem. That they come up, with, they don't write Bhagavad Gita as it is. They write their own interpretation of Bhagavad Gita. But it's nice that people at least they become more aware of the Bhagavad Gita. If there was only our Bhagavad Gita, it would be better. Problem is so many other Bhagavad Gitas now. People are reading all these other Bhagavad Gitas, so they get the wrong direction. 
But we do see the Bhagavad Gita becoming more and more popular. And also Sankirtan. Now in, 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 for example, in USA, in the New York, New York State, upper region of New York State, that means above New York City, upstate New York, they have a region called the Bhajan Belt. The Bhajan Belt is the place where there's so many people doing bhajan and kirtan and singing devotional songs. It's become a fashion there. You know, just like in the past there were things like folk singing and pop music and rock. Now it's bhajan. People are into bhajan and it's really popular. There's a whole belt, a whole, whole spread of it going on in different towns and small places. People coming together and doing bhajan and having kirtans. And so this is this is going on. This is this is the effect of Lord Chaitanya's movement spreading around the world. It's happening, and it's not only just there. That's only just some place. It's, there's so many other places where it's also going on. You can go to Australia. You'll see there's a lot of people there, and you go to Europe. For example, little country Switzerland, there's so many groups of devotees around the, around the country there who are all engaged in their own different practices of devotional service. So this is due to the acharyas, to people like Srila Prabhupada who he instructed us to loudly, loudly chant the holy name, right? Sometimes people, one man and I was doing life membership again, one man said, oh, you people always make so much noise with everything you do, you know. He said, you always do things, you get so How Prabhupada told us to do it. He said, he said, I cannot think small. He said, I have to think big. And he encouraged us to do big. Don't think small. So this is uh, some points. We want to think about. We'll go ahead, text number 10. With the advent of the rainy season, the insignificant streams which had become dry began to swell and then swayed or strayed from their proper courses, like the body, property, and money of a man controlled by the urge of his senses. So this is in relation to uh, a man who may perform austerities to get property and to get fulfill his material desires, but as he gets it, he just wastes it, he squanders it, he doesn't use it properly, he doesn't make proper use of it. At the end of the section here, in text number 10, it's written, in our materialistic way of life, which is just like a desert, we are hankering after an ocean of happiness, but in the form of society, friends and mundane love, we are getting no more than a drop of water. Our satisfaction is never achieved as the small riv rivulets, lakes and ponds are never filled with water in the dry season. So they quote in that purport there about the happiness from material life is just like a drop of water in the desert. So the point is there's no real happiness in the desert. We don't want to go looking for water in the desert. We want to find the real place where there's happiness. And that, of course, is in the spiritual world. That is in our relationship with Lord Krishna and doing bhakti yoga, devotional service. But people forget this. They, be, they, be, they become so infatuated by the material energy that they're thinking the family and the, the bodily beauty and the children and the home and the money, that this is their happiness. But these things are all ephemeral, they're all temporary, they're, they have no such, they're not going to maintain for long. They will be there for some time, but not forever. So we're, we're, we're encouraged to remember 
the reality, what is the actual situation, that these things are very temporary. And here, they're compared to the water, which is in little ponds and lakes, which dries up in course of time. I see here in Mayapur, they have land around here where we're living, and the land, when it rained, oh, it filled up with water, but after a couple of months, it's all dry again. And so typically, it's, it's very common in, these, in this agricultural region here in Mayapur, around the Ganga Basin, the land is low, and the land may be floody, but then it floods it and then it dries up. Doesn't stay forever. Text number 11. Another example is given. The newly grown grass made the earth emerald green. The Indragopa insects added a reddish hue. And white mushrooms added further colour and circles of shade. Thus the earth appeared like a person who had suddenly become rich. <coughs> so, th this is a, this, <coughs> this example shows us the colour, the beauty of Vrindavan, the colourful, very colourful. Everything is emerald green, it's all green because heavy rain, so everywhere is green and fresh looking. And then there's these red insects, the Indra Gopa, red, so red and green. And then you've got these white mushroom stalks. So the white mushrooms. And Sridhar Swami, <laughs> is it here? Sridhar Swami, and there's a quote, oh yeah, Sridhar Swami compares, he says, it's just like a king, the opulence of the king. He has his army. He has his whole palace, he has all the, the, the entourage. <laughs> so he said it's just like that. This, the opulence, the colour, very attractive, red and white and green. Going ahead, text number 12. With their wealth of grains, the fields give joy to the farmers. But those fields created remorse, remorse in the hearts of those who were too proud to engage in farming and who failed to understand how everything is under the control of the Supreme. Okay, with the wealth of grains, because of the rain. So, rain is, of course, we like rain. If you're a farmer, at least, you, you like rain. Of course, not too much, <laughs> but it's important to be able to grow crops. You have to have rain, then you can grow more grains. Um, that's good. Mentioned here. Uh, although they certainly, and people don't, <laughs> talking about the materialistic people, they don't like rain. If you live in the city, you think, oh, it's raining, oh no, you live in the city, we don't like it. But for the people in the countryside, rain is good because it's a chance to nourish the crops. And... Uh, the materialistic people, they do not appreciate that with the rain, the Supreme Lord is feeding not only human beings, but also plants, animals, and the earth itself. So the Lord is doing his duty. He arrange, arranges the, the rain. Of course, he has to be satisfied with yagya to get rain. We know from the Bhagavad Gita, rain is born of yagya. Yagna is born of prescribed duty. 
so when when there's a good rain the the earth is happy and all the animals also they get more food to eat the grass grows better so this verse is uh, glorifying the farmers Srila Prabhupada used to say that farming is the most pious profession. Bec they're simply depending on nature, depending on the, the will of the Lord to produce the food, to do their farming, to grow their crops. They have to depend on nature. And whose nature is it? Of course, the Supreme Lord is controlling nature. So farming is a very pious profession. Other people working in the cities, industrial people and capitalists and so on, they, they're not very pious. But farmers are generally pious people. So in his life of the Bhagavad, Prabhupada writes extensively about this, about the farmers and how they're really glorified, working, producing the grains for the people, Here, in this uh, Srimad Bhagavatam, Ridayananda Maharaj writes about the American situation in the USA, what happens and how the government, they don't encourage the farmers at all. And they, sometimes even when the farmers grow something, it will all be thrown away. Oh, you've got too much of that. The price will, be, it will ruin the price. We have to throw it in the ocean. And they will throw the food into the ocean rather than give it to people who could who could eat it. So, a God-conscious government will provide abundance and happiness for all. That's, that's certainly an important point. We, we need to have the good government. We need to have, and to get the good government, people have to be good themselves, because it's the people who elect the government. We have these democratic situations, so the people are responsible for electing the government. But the, because the people themselves are not very good, so they get governments who are also not very good. We can't really blame everyone else. I'll just go to the length of the Bhagwan and we'll have a look at that statement there to see what Prabhupada says. Oh, what happened? You can see it, like the Bhagwan? Yes, Maharaj, we see it. Okay. Oh. Okay, here we are. Yeah, from the light of the Bhagavad Prabhupada said, Agriculture is the noblest profession. It makes society happy, wealthy, healthy, honest, and spiritually advanced for a better life after death. You can see Prabhupada really glorifying the farmers. And, and properly so. And then Prabhupada goes on to talk about Lord Krishna, how Lord Krishna, he took birth in the Vaishya family as the son of Nanda Maharaj. He, he said, by his personal example, Lord Krishna wanted to teach us the value of protecting cows. And Balaram, of course, he carries the plow, so Lord Balaram, he's the one teaching us agriculture. And Lord Krishna, he plays a flute, so he's with the cows. But from Krishna and Balaram, we see the importance of these two things, agriculture and cow protection. And then Prabhupada talks about trading and how Vaishyas also, of course, they do trading. So Prabhupada explains here, he said, trading means it's meant for transporting surplus produce to places where the produce is scanty. But when traders become too greedy and materialistic, 
they take to large scale, large scale commerce and industry and allure the poor agriculturalist to unsanitary industrial towns with a false hope of earning more money. The industrialist and the capitalist do not want the farmer to remain at home satisfied with his agricultural produce. Isn't this true? I certainly, I, I see this in India, they tell me some, some places in India, they want to grow rice, they have no people to plant the rice. Where are all the people? They all went to work in the factories. And similarly in China, it's the same in China. You know, China is also actually like India. It's really a, a, a rural-based uh, society, although now it's become so industrialized. But they have so much land. China is such a big, huge area, so much land. But you go into the villages and the villages are empty. Only the old people are there and the children. And all the other people, the adults, they've all gone to the factories to work. Why? Get money, make money. So this is what they wanted. This is what the capitalists want to do. And, and they, that in this way, they can exploit more the farmers. Mm. Prabhupada writes, but the real fact is that humanity must depend on agriculture and subsist on agricultural produce. The industrialist, he goes to the villagers to purchase the food grains. He is unable to produce in his factory. Srila Prabhupada was always encouraging the devotees that we have to prepare for the future and he wanted us to have farm projects. And Srila Prabhupada told us, he said, this modern civilization will never succeed. It was, it's doomed to failure. And he encouraged the devotees, he said, you should get your own land and you should grow your own food. You should become self-sufficient. Don't depend on others all the time just to produce your food. So this is very, a very significant point, of course. And, more and more devotees are realizing this. For example, it's Holiness Bhakti Raghava Swami is a wonderful example in this regard. Bhakti Raghava Swami, he's really promoting Varnashram, of course, and he's encouraging all his disciples that they should grow their own food. And he tells them, he says, I'll come to your home, but I'm only going to eat what you grow, what you've grown yourself. If you didn't produce it yourself, I don't want it. That's his, his motto. He will only eat what, what the devotees, what his disciples grow. And Prabhupada also liked us to do like that. He, Prabhupada even told us, he said, you know, in the future you may not even be able to get paper. You may have to make your own paper. And he said, you want to print books, you may have to get your own paper. You should know how to make paper. And Prabhupada, when, we, and when he began Mayapur, we had the devotees spinning cloth and making gumshas and making dhotis and saris. It was all going on. Cottage industry, Prabhupada wanted it very much. So this is the glorification of the, the Vaishya. Mm -hmm. No, this one. Okay, back in the Bhagavatam here. Text number 13. As all creatures of the land and water took advantage of the newly fallen rainwater, their forms became attractive and pleasing. Just as a devotee becomes beautiful by engaging in the service of the Supreme Lord. <laughs> and Prabhupada gives his example, this is quite well known. I think everybody must know this about Prabhupada said devotees look like they came from Vaikuntha, they got tea like on, they shaved their heads, they're clean, 
when they first come they're dirty and grubby and they don't look good, you know, long hair and everything. But after becoming devotees, they become really devote, really like Vaikuntavasis. So that's mentioned here in the Srimad Bhagavatam also. Sukadeva Goswami predicted this. Going ahead, text 14. Where the rivers joined the ocean, it became agitated, its waves blown about by the wind, just as the mind of an immature yogi becomes agitated because he is still tainted by lust and attached to the objects of sense gratification. So the example is given here, the rivers flowing into the sea and the, and the, with the wind, big waves come up and it's just like the mind of the immature yogi who's disturbed by material desires. What should somebody do in that situation? Someone's a yogi, he's an immature yogi, and maybe a neophyte yogi, and he's disturbed by material desires. What would you suggest such a person, what actions does he need to take? Right? Who's there? Who's the brahmacharis? We've got some brahmacharis in this class, haven't we? Uh, we can engage, we can ask them to engage their senses in Krishna services. Oh, okay. Is that going to help him? He's troubled with sex desire or something? Do you think that's going to be enough for him? His mind will be engaged by engaging in Krishna service. When he chants and he does some physical services. You think he's able to engage his mind? His mind is agitated, sex desire. You think he can really just put his mind so easily into Krishna's service? What does he need to do? He needs more association of Krishna in the form of hearing and chanting. The more he meditates on Krishna... Who is he going to get that association from? From advanced devotees. Yes. This is the answer. This is what we want to hear. And this is what Prabhupada writes in the light of the Bhagavad. Prabhupada said, he has to take shelter of an advanced devotee. In the association of a strong devotee, the strong devotee can immediately capture his mind and fix him in Krishna consciousness. Just like sometimes people take sannyas when they're immature, they're not properly, they're not very well prepared, not very qualified, so they can get agitated sometimes. In, in fact, in Srila Prabhupada's time, we know there were many young men who took sannyas and they were sincere initially. But they had difficulties and many went away, many gave up, very few survived. So what they need to do actually is take the shelter of the advanced devotee. They have difficulty, go and, go and be with Prabhupada, go and travel with, they could go and travel with Prabhupada or find another senior devotee who is not having that problem and be with him and work with him. Don't be alone. That's the point. Don't be alone with your mind. You have to take shelter of an advanced devotee, somebody who is fixed in Krishna consciousness. So you take, you take shelter of another senior Vaishnava, and then in the association of another fixed up sannyasi, they can help you to be strong in Krishna consciousness. Okay, we'll go ahead. Text number 15. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes. Sorry Maharaj. No, go ahead. Prabhupada's disciples, when Prabhupada left, where they took shelter? On Prabhupada's books? Yes. There was no, no one who is like senior no. uh, to take care of these young sannyasis. Well, there are. There are senior sannyasis. There are people who took sannyas earlier in the movement, they've had more experience. And they can give, they give also association. You know, we see the, 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 there were senior sannyasis in Prabh, even in Prabhupada's time. Maybe there were not very many years in the movement, but they were very strong and very strict in their principles of Krishna consciousness. 
So taking association from them, one could get a lot of benefit, one could get shelter. Although Prabhupada left, even after Prabhupada's departure or even in Prabhupada's time, some sannyasis were more senior than others. It's not that everybody's the same. Okay. Some sannyasis are, you know, they're, and, and that's understood. And Prabhupada writes in some purports, he talks about you can accept even some, somebody may be your own god brother, but you can accept them as your spiritual master and you can take shelter of them and you can take a, and do service for them and be very benefited by their association. Even though you may be a senior devotee, you may even be a sannyasi yourself, but still you can take shelter of another sannyasi. And with this association of another sannyasi, you can become stronger again in Krishna consciousness and protect you from these material desires which may come in the mind. So, oh yes, there are senior devotees, you, you know, there are uh, people who are, you know, in, in just in Prabhupada's time, they were senior. They were doing more service, they were more, more fixed and more steady in their Krishna conscious practice. It's, it's not all one. We don't think, oh, I'm, I'm Prabhupada disciple, he's Prabhupada disciple, what's the difference? No, there is a difference, right? There's a difference. You have to look at how they do service and how they practice sadhana and how they're engaged. Yeah? You understand, Prabhu? Yes, Maharaj. Thank you, Maharaj. Okay, text number 15, just as devotees whose minds are absorbed in the personality of Godhead remain peaceful, even when attacked by all sorts of dangers, the mountains in the rainy season were not at all disturbed by the repeated striking of the rain-bearing clouds. So, of course, when there's heavy storms, the heavy storms hit the mountains, but the mountains don't get disturbed by it. You know, big mountains, a heavy rainstorm's coming. The rainstorm is just going to clean the. It will clean the mountain. It will wash off the wash the sides of the mountain. It will clear the dirt from the mountain and make the mountain shine. So the same way, devotees. They may be in some kind of difficulty. They may have some difficult situations. It, here it talks about attack by all sorts of dangers. So devotees, as devotees, we, we do see sometimes we're in these dangerous situations. You go to preach in different places, it's not so easy sometimes. So there are dangers, what do we do? Well, we just remember Krishna. So devotees who are like these mountains, they can absorb their mind in Krishna and they remain peaceful. Just like... But not every devotee is able to do it. We just heard the other, the other, the previous text was talking about the immature yogi who gets agitated by lust. But here, other devotees, they're like a big, they're like a strong mountain. They're not affected at all. And they, they, like the mountain becomes more beautiful, in the same way the devotee also is getting more mercy of Krishna. They becomes... It becomes uh, purified, more, more and more advanced. From, uh, it's stated here, similarly, an advanced devotee of the Supreme Lord is not shaken from his devotional program by dis disturbing conditions, which instead cleanse the heart of the dust of attachment to this world. So that's what we want. We want to get rid of the dust, the attachment to this world. We want that. But you have to be to take the risk. It, it's, there's some risk, there's dangers there, sorts of dangers. You go out into the field of preaching. So there are always dangers. 
You have to be cautious. You have to remember Krishna. And if you're not very strong, then maybe you don't want to take that kind of risk. You shouldn't go out there into this, that dangerous. You have to know what is your capability. What are you able, how much are you able to tolerate? How much can you put up with? If you're not so strong, if you're e easily agitated, sexually disturbed, lusty desire, it's not a good idea. You want to put yourself in a better situation, a safer situation. So we have to know your capability, what you can do, what you can put up with and what you can't. Going ahead, number 16, we give, during the rainy season, the roads not being cleansed became covered with grass and debris and were thus difficult to make out. These roads were like religious scriptures that brahmanas no longer study and that thus become corrupted and covered over with the passage of time. Have you any experience of this kind of thing? The brahmanas no longer study. They're brahmanas. They don't study. They don't read the scriptures anymore. So it's described to be like roads which are washed out. They're covered with grass and debris. Difficult to see where's the actual road. Do you have any experience of this? Nobody? Maharaj, may I say something? Yeah, please do. Um, in South India, I have observed that there are many uh, so-called Brahmanas and uh, uh, they do not spend time reading scriptures and things like that. And then when we invite them to our house for like doing some ritualistic ceremony, and uh, they would want coffee, they, uh, you know, before the program starts, and they eat pan, and and when when they chant all the different mantras, many times they don't even know what it what it means. You know, it's where they they don't they don't study. You know, they just learn some like a skill. You know, they learn like a skill for uh, existence. No? And but they expect that kind of respect. You know, I am a brahmana. And if you get my blessing, then everything will be. And people do get uh, blessings, but there is a class of people who are becoming very tired of this kind of people. You know, yes, they don't respect them anymore. In fact, in in Tamil Nadu, where I come from originally, many many temples, the government has employed. Um, um, People who are not Brahmana by birth, you know, they are um, just like you fill up the position of a bus driver or something, you know, they accept applications and uh, they fill up the post of priest in temple and, and those people, they don't have any exposure to scripture. So it's becoming like a business more or less, you know, you give me money, I give you blessing kind of thing. <laughs> Yes, it's true. I, 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 was, I, I was in uh, the, well, in Malaysia, there was one temple, and the, the priest there was a Christian. <laughs> it was a Hindu temple, but the priest was a Christian. <laughs> I was shocked. So this, this kind of situation comes. And sometimes they say, well, I'm a Kali Yuga Brahmin. Kali Yuga Brahmins, we can do everything, we, we eat everything, we can do everything. You know, if you invite the, the Brahmanas, the Hong Kong Brahmanas, Hong Kong Brahmana that can be like that. They want to drink a lot of alcohol, so intoxication and things. There's a very big problem, what is going on in Kali Yuga? I'll just... Thanks. Yes? Uh, still some devote, uh, brahmanas are there, they have studied, studied shastras, 
but they have not come to the conclusion that supreme personality of Godhead is Krishna. Okay. Yes. Well, they may, you know, we can accept that they, they may, maybe they accept the Paramatma, maybe they're meditating on the Paramatma, maybe they worship Lord Vishnu, maybe they're worshipping uh, even Lord Shiva. Anyway, they have their ideas, yeah. But, you know, something, <laughs> they have some kind of direction. But we're generally tolerant about these things, you know, we have to understand this Kali Yuga and there are so many different divisions, you know, we can't expect everybody's just going to immediately accept Krishna because the Lord Vishnu has been mentioned so much. Lord Vishnu is there and Lord Shiva is also temple, his temples are more than Lord Krishna. So here's Prabhupada's writing on this section and from this verse from the light of the Bhagavad. He said, a covered road is exactly like a brahmana who is not accustomed to studying and practicing the reformatory practices of Vedic injunctions. He becomes covered with the long grasses of illusion. In that condition, forgetful of his constitutional nature, he forgets his position of eternal servitorship to the personality of Godhead. By being deviated by the seasonal overgrowth of long grasses created by Maya, a person identifies himself with illusory productions of nature and succumbs to illusion forgetting his spiritual life. So this is a situation in Kali Yuga. People fall into that kind of situation. Brahmanas. Oh, very difficult. We, we are trying to establish what is actually the real Brahmana. All right, so here we are, text number 17. It's an interesting one, text 17. Though the clouds are the well-wishing friends of all living beings, the lightning, fickle in its affinities, move from one group of clouds to another, like lusty women, unfaithful even to virtuous men. Well, sometimes it's the other way around. Here, here it's like this, it's talking about lusty women, unfaithful to virtuous men. Sometimes it's virtuous women and the men are unfaithful. It's not necessarily only like this. Prabhupada, uh, anyway, Sukadeva Goswami is generally, he's, he's speaking to men. When Sukadeva Goswami was speaking Srimad Bhagavatam, there were no women present. So his audience were men. So he's speaking to men. He's talking that you know, sometimes lusty women are unfaithful even to virtuous men. And Prabhupada com uh, Srila Prabhupada comments, During the rainy season, lightning appears in one group of clouds and then immediately in another group of clouds. So this is phenomena as compared to lusty women. She doesn't fix her mind on one man. And so it's a common situation. We see today, you know, that so many people, they marry and remarry and, you know, this, this marriage, oh no, this one not successful, try again, get married again. So this has been going on a lot. It's very common in the world today, becoming more and more common. It becomes so bad that people sometimes, they don't even bother to marry. They just simply live with each other in the name of married life, and you have what called common law, husband and wife, right? They're living together without marriage. So Prabhupada's comment on it, it is therefore recommended that a woman desiring to advance in Krishna consciousness peacefully live with a husband, and that the couple not separate under any condition. 
the husband and wife should control sex indulgence, concentrate their minds on Krishna consciousness so their life may be successful. After all, in the material world, a man requires a woman, and a woman requires a man. So when they are combined, they should live peacefully in Krishna consciousness and should not be restless like the lightning flashing from one group of clouds to another. A very uh, powerful example, the lightning flashing from one cloud to another. Of course, these things are, you know, it's easy to say these things, that you should live with this man and not separate, and it, it's very good if you think like that. It's not always so easy for people to apply it. And Prabhupada even saw, he had, he had, his, uh, he had a servant, his own, Prabhupada's own servant, so he got married, but then after some time it didn't work and he had to, you know, the marriage broke up and then he got married again, like this, you know. So even people who were very close to Prabhupada, they had difficulties with their marriage. Even when the first marriage, Prabhupada had approved it, and Prabhupada, when the servant got married, Prabhupada gave them both rings. He gave the husband and wife rings. And in the beginning of our movement, Prabhupada would even arrange the marriages for the couples. But he saw that the marriages were not working out, and the couples were separating and divorcing each other. So Prabhupada said, I don't want to be involved anymore with this. You can arrange your own marriages. This happened quite early on in our movement. Prabhupada became so disappointed with the devotees that they couldn't live together. They, they couldn't live together peacefully. They couldn't live together as, house, as, uh, house, as Krishna conscious grihastas and they would divorce and separate and get married and go off with somebody else. So Prabhupada said, I don't want an, any more involvement with your marriages. You people arrange your own marriages. So that's what happened in our Krishna consciousness movement. Of course, that time the devotees in the movement, they were young and they were Westerners and they were not familiar with the culture. It's a little different for people brought up in India. Because at least in India, people have that kind of culture a bit more, that the, the, the marriages are arranged and they will accept it and go on with it and they, they will not think of divorce. But the Western culture is so, so degraded. And now that degradation is also coming also into India also. Any comments? Anyone? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. Can I say something? Please do. Uh, recently, when I was talking to my mom, not so like, maybe like a few years ago, a year or two ago, when I was talking to my mom, she commented that the Supreme Court in India has um, said that any affair outside of marriage will not be anymore considered illegal. Before the wife had the right to even arrest the husband and things like that, you know, or vice versa. But now it's legal to have um, affairs outside of marriage. There will be no consequences. And uh, they can always divorce, you know, the option is there, but nobody can anymore um, make any case if the husband or wife is not faithful, no, as per Indian law. So the, you mean a man can have more than one wife? He will have legally only one wife, but he will not face any consequences if he is having an affair outside of marriage. Oh. Before he would be arrested and, and there will be some legal consequence if the wife wants, you know, or the husband for the wife and wife for the husband. There could be legal consequence. It was not accepted as a good practice. Mm -hmm. But now the government has um, sanctioned it as a proper 
you know that, that there will be no consequence for such actions oh my goodness and, and that's true even for women also yes hmm. yeah and just see how Kali Yuga is penetrating and the influence of the age of Kali so much degradation the people can do what they want without any consequence of course that's in the eyes of the government in the eyes of the government they're not going to be punished but according to Shastra according to scripture there will be punishment for that so they can they may escape from the laws of the government uh, the, the, the laws of the government may accommodate that kind of behavior but certainly the scriptures don't accommodate that kind of behavior And they can I make it? Yes. Generally, what we found was that uh, uh, no one is telling people that uh, that even after you divorce, you will just remain as husband and wife. Uh, like uh, it, it is uh, the the marriage is not uh, just a legal affair. The marriage is also a bondage which is uh, made by uh, by some karmic arrangement. And once they are married. Uh, till they die, they have to remain husband and wife, or the husband has to take sannyas. Uh, till the time they have to remain husband and wife. Even if the husband takes sannyas, then wife is considered only as a widow. She is not free from marriage. Uh, but but this is not being properly taught to youngsters, even within the devotee community. So they think that by getting a divorce, marriage gets cancelled. So there is no concept of cancelling a marriage. Which means that the, the consequence, even after divorce, has to be faced by the husband or the wife because they are still married. Uh, divorce is just a paper which has no meaning according to Shastra. So somehow this education is not uh, being given uh, to even within the devotee community. Devotees think that, uh, okay, we can divorce, we can marry again. Uh, but Prabhupada is quite, um, strong. quite strong in uh, in what, in how he writes, uh, he accepts, proper accepts separation uh, when uh, the husband is uh, uh, Naradama or wife is uh, adulterous, then mm. proper accepts separation. He says that according to Vedic system, they can be separated. Yes. Uh, but uh, but proper doesn't accept remarriage, except uh, especially for women. Uh, proper very strongly writes in one of the purports, uh, saying that. Uh, if a woman remarries, it constitutes uh, prostitution. Prostitution, right. That's right. It's a fact. But in general, but in general nobody speaks about these things now. Uh, nobody wants to uh, upset the apple cart in that sense. Yes. Mm. So that, that lack of training is also another great aspect uh, in, in, uh, in not having proper awareness about what constitutes a marriage and uh, what is the sanctity of marriage, etc. Yes, education is very important, you're right. Nowadays we, we do have, like in USA, there's a thing called Grihasta Vision Team, GVT. The GVT, Grihasta Vision Team. And it's a group of uh, very senior devotees who are in family life and they make it a point to tr help people prepare for marriage. Because entering into marriage is a responsibility and it's a commitment and people should be aware of what's happening when they enter. And it's unfortunate that a lot of people, particularly in the West, that we, we don't really, we're not really aware of it. We never thought about it. We never, we just thought, you know, my wife, you know, somebody to have a relationship with. We never really thought about the commitment and the responsibility and the planning which are required. His, Holi His Holiness Jai Pataka Swami prepared a, a questionnaire for couples who are entering into married life. And it's about a hundred questions, you know. And the, the, hus the husband, the, you know, the proposed, the prospective husband and wife, before they get married, they should go through these questions with each other. And they should answer these questions together. And in this way, they get a bit better, a much better uh, preparation for married life. 
because they have to understand what does this woman expect or what does this man expect what's going you know what what's the future going to be like often we, we don't they don't even think about that we enter into family married life without thinking and that's why pr problems come so immaturity lack of preparation no proper guidance so these things are the real problems and we're trying to work against that trying to prepare people and uh, as, as time goes on our movement is having much better success although in the beginning the marriages were not very successful but more recently it's been much better Arikshna Maharaj yes Maharaj in the past like uh, even prostitutes also uh, went back to Godhead are they who prostitutes who have engaged in Krishna consciousness, they are in Krishna. Well, well, I don't know about prostitutes, but Putana went back to God, huh? But in the small, small stories, they say like this. Maybe because of that, devotees are, uh, we are licensed, you know? That's why they are not following. <laughs> Even prostitutes can go back to God. The Lord is so merciful. So we are getting legally married. Well, it will, depend, if they, it will depend on their attitude. If they consider themselves very fallen, you know, <laughs> if they're thinking I'm very fallen, I'm very fallen, then, that, then, then probably maybe they can go back to Godhead. But they have, they have to have the right mood to go back to Godhead. It's not they can go back to Godhead thinking I'm a prostitute and I'll be a prostitute in the spiritual world. It's not like that. There are no prostitutes in the spiritual world. That's not going to be there. That profession is not there. Right? Like Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's mood is like that, no? Who is the most fallen one? <laughs> he will be delivered. <laughs> yes, well, that is the mood of all advanced devotees. Naratam Das Thakur, Lochan Das Thakur, they're all saying, I'm the most fallen, my claim is first, take me back to Godhead. The people who are actually fallen, they're thinking, yeah. they, don't, they don't always think I'm so fallen. The people who are really fallen, they often don't understand that they're fallen. Um, actually, I just read in the, in first canto, when the Lord was coming to Hastinapur, so there were many prostitutes were there, and Prabhupada said, uh, he's writing the purport, and they are devotees of the Lord, so they can be devotees of the Lord. Oh yes, they can be devotees, there's no doubt. It's in Dwarka. It's when the Lord came to Dwarka. The, yes. The, the, yes, yes, Dwarka. Sorry, the, Dwarka. They all came out to meet him. And the, the prostitutes were also there. And Prabhupada talks about how prostitutes are there in the society, that there's a particular class of men who have to have that kind of uh, com opportunity or something. Yes, so they were there. They were devotees. But it doesn't necessarily mean that they're pure devotees, that they're going to go back to Godhead. They may be there in Dwarka. But I'm, I don't know. And they may, of course, they come out and see Lord Krishna. That's very good. It's certainly very beneficial for them. But I don't know if they're going to go straight back to Godhead. Maybe when they get old, maybe they change, you know, and they, become, they give up their bad habits in their old age. And, become more cultured uh, or take up a different profession. I don't know. Prabhupada doesn't, didn't really explain these things. One, one point I heard recently, one devotee was explaining, he said that in, in Vaikuntha there's no renunciates. That in Vaikuntha everyone's a householder. The, the, there are no renunciates. There's no question of being a sannyasi or a, a brahmachari, you know. Everyone's a grahasta there in, the, in Vaikuntha. 
So that's, I thought that was interesting. Um, you, you know, the spiritual world, you're not going to renounce. Maharaj, but in Golok Vrindavan, there are brahmacharis, Gryasthas. Really? The cowherd boys are all brahmacharis. <laughs> Who? Cowherd boys. Well, that, they get married. They're young boys, and as they grow up, they get the parents get them married. So they will be always eternally young boys, no, Maharaj? Uh, yeah, if they okay, if they stay eternally young boys, but <laughs> they go, they go out with, but they're married. They can be married also. The gopis are mostly married, right? We hear they're married. Who did the gopis marry? They marry cowherd boys. Yes. Anyway, you got Madhu Mangal. Madhu Mangal is not married. I don't think he's married. <laughs> Madhu Mangal, Krishna's friend. Okay, but yes, anything, Prabhu? Maharaj, can I say something regarding all this topic? Yes, please do. Maharaj, uh, now current situation in our Eastern society, uh, I can see that many divorces are taking place. So why this? Uh, uh, divorce was taking place because before getting married they did not check their compatibility, astrological chart. That's why uh, this uh, divorce takes place in hearts. Well, the astro astrology more. is not 100%. The astrology is some indication but it's not 100%. Of course, it's it's, 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 in Bhagavata Maharas, yeah, yeah, it's, it's it's a guide. It's a guide, but it's not one hundred percent. I've seen couples with very good astrology compatibility, but the marriage broke down. Yes, Maharaj, I would, I, I would totally agree with you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Rather, I would, I would, I would. To, to this argument, I, I can, if I may add, uh, why don't the astrologers become a party when there is a divorce case? <laughs> the astrologer should also be dragged to the court that he gave this uh, guarantee that the marriage will be 100% successful. And now they are getting divorced. We, the astrologer should be also be dragged to the court to explain why is this happening. Yeah. <laughs> You have to understand the astrologers are not perfect. These are, you know, people who do the astrology, they may not be so perfect. They try to guide, but it's not always a hundred percent. You can't expect it will be a hundred percent. It's a material science. But it's, it, there is some indication, it's certainly helpful if you have a good compatibility chart, it's certainly helpful to a good marriage. It's certainly something which you would want to check before marriage, to be sure. Particularly if you, you, you're, you're married, you're expecting to have a child, so you can often see that very easily from the chart that, oh, it's very good, yeah, yeah you'll have a couple of children without any trouble. And so some people are happy with that. And sometimes you can see in the chart, oh, you'll never have a child. And so that's a big problem for some people, they really want to have a child. But you can see from a chart that, oh, you'll never get a child, no chance. And so these things, uh, there are some indications here. Okay, we will stop then tonight and we'll meet tomorrow again. Thank you very much. Srila Prabhupada Ki. Go back to Vrinda Ki. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.